Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you. And uh, we're going to have a real, real treat this afternoon. We have uh, Professor Tim Oates from uh, UMBC, um, the Oris Professor, in fact, and uh, almost for us, family professor of computer science and technology. And this is part of the Institute of Political and Computational Research um, program. And we are really excited that in a, in a partnership with UNBC, that we have a formal part of the Institute of Political and Computational Research. And that uh, Professor Oates is going to describe not only his expertise, but the expertise that is in UNBC and the really great opportunity for this, uh, for this campus and also in collaboration with, uh, with UNBC. And this is just the start. Um, so, uh, Tim, thank you very much. The lab is all yours. Okay, thank you. <laughs> right. So, I, I have to say, I've never been to an enrichment seminar talk before. Um, and so, one bad thing about me speaking at my very first one is it's hard to know whether my talk is calibrated appropriately. Um, so I'm going to talk about some work that we've done at UNBC uh, that I'm hoping is going to be presented at a, a level of abstraction such that you can kind of get mental hooks in it and think about how might I use some of these techniques in some of the work that you're doing. Um, also, this is not a large group, so we can be very informal. And if something seems interesting, please feel free to interrupt me at any point and say, hey, I'd like to learn more about that. So um, I did want to give a shout out to the PhD student, Sunil Gandhi, who is the real brains behind the work, sort of pun intended because we're talking about the EEG data. Um, he's going to graduate soon. Um, if anybody's hiring and you, you meet people who do the kind of things I'm talking about in this talk, he's a great person to talk to. Um, so what's the agenda? Uh, the abstract actually said we're going to talk about GANs, which are these things called generative adversarial networks. I'm going to speak in a couple of other things in this talk. Um, and whether you know it or not, you've probably bumped into GANs in the popular press. And so I'm going to start out with a couple of examples of these generative adversarial networks, which is a fairly recent technology that's been developed in machine learning, uh, where you might have seen them in the popular press. And the popular press is trying to be exciting, and so they make GANs look super scary. So we're going to start out with GANs being scary. Then, and really what I'm trying to do there is to get you to say, oh, that's cool, so that you'll bear with me through the next two topics, which are going to be a little bit more boring. Um, but it'll kind of set the framework for the things I'm talking about. Then we're going to come back and talk about these GANs in a little bit more detail, in particular variation that we developed at UMBC. And it will literally be um, horses and zebras and unicorns and rainbows. I promise that those things are going to be in the talk at that level. And then hopefully we'll have time for some open discussion. So like I said, if at any point you want to, um, hang on, let me just move this mouse. Yeah, I get that to go. Okay, so I don't know if you saw this particular thing come across uh, the news, but you can go to thispersondoesnotexist.com and find pictures of people who do not exist. So these are all fake pictures. These people look super real. You can imagine one of them sitting in the room with you right now, but they literally don't exist. And so GANs are used to generate these faces. And we'll talk more, like the idea behind the GAN is just super intuitive. And essentially what you do is you just sort of tickle the input of the network with some random noise and it goes, okay, here's a person. And then you generate it, you give it a little bit more random noise and it goes, okay, here's another person. And you know, I look at those things and I, they look super real. Right? Like I, I, you can't tell that the difference between that and another um, and, and sort of a, a real person. Um, and you know, so there are lots of people who think about nefarious purposes for this. I actually talked to a guy at the company um, who's in the advertising space and it turns out that if you're an actor in a commercial or in a print ad, you get paid in proportion to how much of your body is showing in the ad. So you make less money if it's neck up and more money if it's sort of waist up and if they see your knees and I think you get the full pay, right? So. Um, so, you, you know, you could imagine people might get nervous as, oh, I can generate people wearing, you know, lands in clothing and I don't have to pay anybody. It's just a computer doing it. The second one was, I don't know if you saw this, but they had these tools that can make Obama say anything you want him to say, right? So, but they did, this is getting a little bit closer to the kind of thing that we tend to use GANs for, which is we've got a ton of video and a ton of audio. They're not matched up, but we want to kind of bring 
him together to make the video sync with this audio, even though Obama never said these things. So you can imagine sort of all kinds of much more nefarious purposes that you could put this technology to. So hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have a really good intuitive understanding of at least the underlying technology. So um, now what I want to do is briefly talk about sort of what we do with EEG data, um, because that's going to be a thread that kind of runs throughout the talk. So. Uh, we got interested, or I got interested, I'm not an expert, but I got interested a couple of years ago because I got some money from the Army, who is actually very interested in teaming. So how do I get teams of people and agents to work together effectively? And one of the things that they are really keen on doing is using signals from EEG data. They've got a bunch of neuroscientists sitting up at Aberdeen Proving Ground that are trying to figure out how can I use passive observation of the brain to um, understand how teamwork is going. And so we got involved in that. Now, um, obviously, that thing, that headset, not super comfortable to wear around. Um, so part of the thing is we want something that's comfortable. Uh, a problem is that there's a lot of noise in the data. So if I'm walking around and doing things, the EEG signal gets corrupted. Me in particular, we're kind of focusing on how do we take uh, algorithms and make them completely automatic and embed them uh, so that you can wear these things around. Right. So that, that was our primary concern. And the, the big thing that kills you is the artifact. So, so, you know, I got this great EEG signal and then I blink my eyes and I get something like that. And then I, you know, move my arm and something happens like that. And then an electrode moves, right? Or there's some line noise that's just going, oh, there's a 60 hertz signal because the power nearby is, is oscillating at 60 hertz. So, you know, the problem is that, that if you we actually started out looking at seizure detection, then the issue is that these artifacts can make you think someone's having a seizure. And then also if you're using a brain computer interface to control something, that's bad news. So there are great videos on the web of people using their brains to fly drones around. And you, know, you can imagine that if they sneeze, the drone's gonna go off and do something like that. So the, the standard technique, okay. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sort of talk about a collection of machine learning gadgets that we put together in a system to solve this particular problem. Now, uh, it actually works quite well. So the punchline is I'll have one evaluation slide and I'm gonna to point to one number that's like above 90% and say it works well, right? Um, but what you'll see is that it's a bit uh, Rube Goldberg. It's a little bit cumbersome. There are a lot of parts to it. And then when we get to the GAN stuff, we'll go, ah, like here's this one sort of nice unified approach that solves that entire problem. So just bear with me for a little while while I go through this. Um, and then you'll sort of see the beauty of GANs coming out the other side. So. Um, the most common method for trying to denoise uh, neural signals is EEG, and it works something like this. Does anybody know who that is? So this is one of my favorite slides. So again, Sunil, the student, created it, and he's got a police car, he's got a band playing, a child, a TV. Does anybody recognize that person? I'm, I'm probably, I may be one of the few old enough in here. I think it's Tip O'Neill, who was Speaker of the House a long time ago. <laughs> No idea why Tip O'Neill is in this particular diagram, but so, so think about it this way. There are various things happening in your brain, right? So there's this thing happening in your brain. These are the electrodes. And so an electrode gets put on your scalp, but it can hear sort of all those things happening in your brain, but they're at different positions. So they kind of get different perspectives on what's happening in your brain. And so what ICA does, independent components analysis says, is okay, I've got these electrodes sitting on top of your scalp they're all sort of getting mixtures of all the activity in your brain. What I'd like to do is kind of separate them out into their individual source signals, right? Now, um, what we'll see in a minute is that we'd like to apply that methodology and sort of pull out a source signal or a signal that's corresponding to the noise, right? So if we can sort of pull these things out and get access to the noise, then that's a good thing. Ton of work. Lots of people do work in ICA-based art, uh, artifact removal. Now, the interesting thing about that is that it's, it typically is done manually with a supervisory signal. So what you'll do is you'll go, here is the EG signal. We're going to run ICA on it and say, oh, here's all the base components. And then the human expert goes, and that's the noise right there, right? And then you do it again, and they're going, that's noise, that's noise, that's noise. Then I've got examples of noise and examples of just vanilla EG, and I can train up a machine learning system to identify those things. So what we tried to do was to use a sort of a weak supervisory signal, and we'll talk about how we're going to so, and, and, and as I said, if, if you need me to slow down, I'll slow down a little bit in a minute. Um, I'm just trying to kind of move through this relatively quickly. So what we did was we built the following system. Uh, you get uh, EEG, you run it through ICA, 
you get what we're going to call a bag of components. These are all the sort of signals that the thing uh, that the ICA pulls out. Some of those correspond to brain activity. Some of those correspond to noise of various kinds. We actually do feature extraction. I don't know what happened right there. Um, and then we use this thing called multi-instance learning, which is one of the things that I want to tell you about. And so uh, what we do is out of this MIL section, we get for each of the components, what is the probability that that is noise or not noise? Yeah, I, I don't know. That, that looks right on my slides. Yeah, it's getting rendered oddly on this laptop. Right, I think it's a Mac um, Windows issue. Okay, so let me just sort of go through these things really quickly. So as, as I said, in independent component analysis, you get some, comp some components, there's a system that mixes those together, um, you know, I have an electrode, which is sort of hearing lots of things happening in my brain. We get to observe some uh, mixtures of that thing, and then ICA pulls out those individual components. Now, notice there's like a red, a green, and a blue one. We get a blue, a red, and a green one. The thing is, ICA doesn't know what the order is, right? Like, it can't go, oh, you know, there, here's the input order, here's the output order. So we have to kind of figure out what's what do we see in this particular output of it. So um, what we do then with the brain signal is we like to say, oh, well, the mixture, there's some clean EEG and some artifact. It goes into some mixing system, and we'd like to pull out the clean EEG and the artifact so that we can just subtract, literally subtract out the artifact. So um, that's the, the um, right. So the output of that process then is uh, I get a bunch of individual components of brain activity, some of which might be noise, and they're all in what we're going to call a bag. So we just have a set of these components. You know, what we'd like to know is, are any of those things corresponding to noise? Because if they're noise, we would like to back those out. So what we'll do is we'll hand those off to multi-instance learning. And so here's a neat tool in the machine learning toolbox that's probably a little underappreciated. And here's an example to give you, uh, to sort of give you an, in an intuition behind it. So suppose what I do is I go to Google, and for whatever reason, I type in face and I want to get images of faces. Now, anytime you've ever gone to Google and searched for images of things, you get some things that make sense and some things that don't make sense, right? Then I'm gonna go, and I, I think I'm searching in Italian, and I'm getting faces back, and then here I think I'm searching in French, right? So I'm typing in face in different languages, and I get a set of results back. So notice, there are faces in there, but there are some non-faces. There are faces in there, and I don't know, that's not really a face. That's not a face. I don't know what that is, right? But here's a couple of faces. So think about these things as being, here is a bag of examples. And what we're gonna do is we'll label a bag of things as positive if there is an example of the thing we're looking for in it, right? So that's a positive bag because there's a face in it. There's some garbage in there, but that's okay. That's a positive bag because there's a face in it. And then a negative bag is simply a bunch of images that you get from somewhere else that just don't have the thing you're looking for. Right? So in standard machine learning, it's single instance learning where you say, that's a face, that's a face, that's not a face, that's not a face. Right? In this case, you get a bunch of examples. You know that some of them in the positive bags are the thing you're looking for, and in the negative bags, the thing you're looking for is not there. So it turns out that multi-instance learning is, is, solves exactly that problem where instead of giving an individual instance, I give it a bag, and I'm saying, is that bag a positive or negative bag? And then it can also say, if it's a positive bag, which of the instances in there are positive instances? So which of those things are faces? So what we do then in the sort of end-to-end -end setting is, like I said, we get the EEG data, we run it through ICA, we get the components. These things are now bags. And so what we can do is say, uh, we can label the entire bag as noisy or not noisy. And the way we get the label is, for example, I can have a bone conducting microphone. And it can tell, am I chewing, am I talking? I can have other ways of just going, eh, I think there's some noise in the signal right now, or there's not noise in the signal. So we get a bag label, which is either a positive bag has noise in the EEG and a negative bag doesn't, and we extract that. So, but I, but I, again, sort of in the interest of kind of keeping moving and getting to the um, unicorns and rainbows, um, I will say that we, the, the U.S. Army Research Lab funded this work and that they have a data set that they collected. Um, and we ran a bunch of experiments and then there's my number, which is above 95%, right? So it turns out there are lots of different ways of solving the multi-instance learning problem. 
And depending on the particular method that we were using, we used a thing called a support vector machine with a particular um, kind of uh, algorithm uh, and a particular kind of kernel for that machine. And it turns out that you can very accurately, in this case, identify noise components versus non-noise components in EEG. All right. So let me go for a couple more slides and then I'm just going to see if there are any questions around that. So um, EEG artifact removal system, um, the limitations are a couple of things. One is it's like this big clunky system, right? So we've got lots of different elements in the system. They all have their own hyperparameters. Tuning is a huge pain. Um, and it turns out that the machine learning, the way we solve everything these days, or the, or the, sorry, the way most people want to solve things is just to throw a neural network. Right? Like here's just one giant neural network that's going to solve the entire problem. So the next thing I want to talk about is an end-to-end -end system to clean EEG using deep neural networks and this idea of GANs. Okay, let me just pause there because that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. Are there questions about that at all? Yeah. Let's just talk briefly. What's the exact definition of and the criteria for the positive and bad? Because it looks so. Yeah. What's the exact definition of and the exact criteria Good. for decision for a positive bag? Good. Good. So uh, a positive bag. Okay. So so let me just back up a step. Right. Um, so and if I'm doing kind of standard machine learning, so um, what I'm so imagine what I'm doing is I'm trying to train up a classifier that takes in. Uh, Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to make it relevant to medicine, and I'm probably gonna fail, right? But I'm taking radiology images in, and I'm trying to figure out uh, is there uh, is there an arterial plaque? I'm getting sonogram images, right? And is there a plaque in the artery? The standard way of tra training those things up is to say is to get someone who's an expert in reading those images and say, here's the sonogram, no plaque. Here's one that's no plaque. Those are negative instances. And then here's one that shows an arterial plaque, and here's another one that shows an arterial plaque. Those are positive instances, right? Now, imagine what I do is I change the setup a little bit, which is I'm taking lots and lots of pictures from different perspectives. So what I get is lots of different images, and then someone goes in and goes, yep, in one of those images I see a plaque. So the, to answer your very specific question, if any image in that bag shows evidence of an arterial plaque, it's a positive bag. If none of the images in that bag show evidence of an arterial plaque, it's a negative bag. So the hard part of that is um, in a positive bag, I might have tons and tons of negative instances, and I'm trying to figure out, like, what is that one thing in that bag that makes it positive? Go ahead. Does that help? Yes, yes, this helps a lot. Okay. But the follow-up question mm. is if you had a face of a cat. Mm. So that's a negative bag. Because you got example. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. I'm going to stipulate that it's human faces, right? So, yeah, yeah. Cat faces don't count. That's a negative. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay. Yep. How do you define that? How do you do? Yeah, so, so it, it is, it's all in the, it's all in the process. So, uh, it, it's very problem domain specific. So, um, some of the early work on multi instance learning. I think was in looking at sort of protein folding, and I sort of have a vague understanding of that, but the idea is proteins can fold in different ways, and, and depending on how I fold, I have certain properties or not. And so a protein can generate a bag because it can fold in a bunch of different ways. And then I can say, ah, well, these proteins have some common property to them, and these proteins don't have a common property. And so a bag is, here's a protein, and here's all the different sort of 3D configurations it can generate. So, the, the bag is going to have some sort of a natural domain specific um, definition. Um, but again, these, these problems arise kind of more often than you think where I have a collection of things and something about that collection makes it behave one way and something about this collection makes it behave another way. And it's just a much harder problem, but there are great algorithms for solving. Yeah. Who decides that this EG is without noise or with, with good. noise? Right, right, right. So, uh, so what we're good. So, um, the the weakly supervised part of it is, is that we are assuming that we have access to some method for saying the person is like sitting there quietly doing whatever task, and then we've got some just rough sensors like a bone conducting microphone that when it registers some signal, it means you're chewing or you sneeze. 
maybe what I've got is I've got an electrode here that can tell me am I blinking my eyes. So it is, it is simply, I believe that there's some noise in that signal, right? I don't know what it is. I don't know where it's manifesting itself. That's noisy. And then when all those sort of indicators are silent, there's not noise. And of course, that's not perfect. But it is the case that these algorithms are good at sort of dealing with modes. Right? So this is dealing with more modes. Because there could be different sorts of artifacts as well. Yeah, that's right. So there could be okay. sort of external electrical artifacts, right? And, so, yeah. and, and, in, and in fact, if we don't have some way of just going, something bad is happening in the EEG, then those bags are going to come in as negative bags, right? Because we don't know that there's something going on in them. But again, the algorithms, given enough data, are actually pretty good at dealing with mislabeled bags. Yep. Okay. Good. All right. That, okay. So the, yeah. um, the algorithm, how many sampling ones uh, do we need to, to test to, you know, yeah. to train? So the, the, yeah, the, the standard answer yeah. is it depends. Uh, <laughs> right. So, um, so, so for this data set, we had 20, sort of 20-ish subjects where the, some, of the data, some of the data was garbage, right? We had about 20 subjects. And probably had about you know 30 minutes of you know 1,000 hertz EEG, and we did windowing on that, right? So you got about half an hour of EEG per subject for 20 subjects, and you can sort of run windows over those things. So maybe you use half of it for training and half for testing. So you know we're we're talking on the order of thousands of bags, um, not hundreds. And this is just a hard problem. I, think, right? I mean, anybody who's ever done anything with EEG realizes it's a mess, right? So um, the, if the data is cleaner, right, so in other circumstances, you can get away with far fewer bags. So the work I was talking about on protein folding, I think they had much less data. You know, they're not going to have tens of thousands of examples. They're going to have, you know, dozens of examples, for example. Um, and so, again, it just it depends on the, the application, it, like what, what the nature of the data is. Yeah. In terms of the protein folding, mm. I can see the uh, translation of um, Multi-instance multi learning, yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms of the brain, like, uh, EEG, oh, so in the EEG, can, translational of oh, EEG. yeah, I don't know if there's a trans. I don't know. I have to. Can we, can we take that offline? Because that, that's you, you have just gotten to a part of my brain where I'm going to have to sit and think. Um, mm -hmm. So, but let's. That's a great conversation to have. Can we? Can we do that after? Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, that's right. Right, right. So, the, so the idea is that the so, so the question is essentially sort of what's the relationship between the number of things going on in your brain, right, and the number of components that I get out. When you run ICA, you get a number of components out, which is equal to the number of sensors I have on your head, right. So. Think about those things as being, right, they're, they're, if I have two sensors and I'm getting this sort of mixture of things happening inside your brain, and um, the math is such that you can only extract as many components as I have kind of independent views of what's happening in the brain. Now, um, I would like to think that even though high resolution EEG might have, um, you know, 64 or 128 sensors, there's more than that amount of stuff going on in my head at any one time. Um, and so it's clearly an imperfect, imperfect thing, right? But uh, again, what, they, what the, the army guys have found is that you can actually do really interesting things by extracting those underlying brain signals, denoising them, and then using them for some of this downstream signals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, in school, there's some pretty important some machine learning. Mm -hmm. So, um, implantable defibrillators. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a very specific catch. Mm. of an ECG or part of an ECG right. that triggers a life-saving event. Right. Um, insulin pumps. Now they will look at what's happening to glucose or mm. internal of insulin. Mm -hmm. So is the trouble with EEG is that the brain is really 50 different, 100 different organs. Yeah. And that's what's so complex. And if you could just pick out one particular organ, one part of the brain, then you could start figuring it out step by step. Yeah. So, so my, uh, so I think the, the the sensing is really poor. So my understanding, actually, in talking to some of the uh, the neurologists who work here, is that if if you're willing to let me drill a hole in your skull and put a sensor on your brain, 
like I can do really amazing things. So they can, so my understanding is that you can even do seizure prediction based on that. Yeah. The issue is that failing that, then all that signal sort of going through your skull and getting mixed as it comes through there. And so just the, the sensing modality is poor, right? It's a ton of noise, right? You know, like imagine, um, I, I, I don't know, you decided to start playing your stereo really loudly during this talk. Um, it'd be real hard to hear. It's that kind of situation. Okay, so let me, great, those are great questions. Let me, let me move on to the, um, to sort of the, the unicorns and rainbows part. Um, so uh, about 2014, uh, it's getting a good fellow had this unbelievably cool idea, which in retrospect, you go, oh, that makes a lot of sense. I wish I had come up with it. Um, and there are these things called adversarial, generative adversarial networks. And that picture is meant to convey that they are very finicky um, in ways that you will understand in just a minute. So here's, here's what, it, again, sort of how it works. And so um, uh, if you come away from this talk, so two things, it sounds like people kind of get multi-instance learning, which is awesome. If you kind of get GANs at the end of this, I'd be happy about that too. So here's the way to think about this thing. I have two neural networks. One is called the generator and one is called the discriminator. All right. This is meant to indicate kind of normally distributed random noise. It doesn't matter. So I have some source of random noise. I hand that as an input to the neural network. And so, you know, I don't know how much you know about neural networks these days, but you give them an input, they do some super complicated computation and then they produce an output, right? So it's just a function. This thing is learning a mapping from a random input to an image, all right? And what you do is you say, okay, I am going to get a random input. I am going to push it through my function. My output is gonna be an image, which could just be, you know, like 100 times 100 numbers and that's 100 by 100 pixel, right? Then I hand it over to the discriminator and the discriminator goes, is that a real picture of the thing I care about or is it a fake picture? So think about the, this person does not exist.com, right? In that case, that generator is generating pictures of people and the discriminator is trying to figure out, did you just make that person up or is that a real person, right? So in practice, it looks a lot like this. So to train this thing up, you will hand it sometimes real pictures of things. Right? So I'm going to find real examples of cats or real examples of people. I'll hand it to the discriminator and it will output something early on before it's learned anything. It'll go, you know, I don't know, real fake, real fake, real fake, right? But we have ways of training these neural networks. And if it goes real, you go, that's correct. And you'll reinforce that behavior. And if it said fake in that particular case, you'd say you were wrong and the network would update its weight. So it gets better at telling the difference between real and fake images. In this case, I give, you know, it's like I said, I kind of tickle the input of that network, it produces some picture, and if the discriminator says that's fake, right, then the discriminator gets rewarded, but then what you do is you go, hey, function G generator, this guy just figured out that your thing was fake, and there are these nice ways of sort of training this thing end to end so that this guy gets better at fooling the discriminator. Right? So it's like an arms race where the generator is saying, I'm trying to fool the discriminator. The discriminator is trying to catch the generator and they're just sort of kind of ratcheting up and learning at the same time. So ultimately what happens is that as the generator gets better, the discriminator has to catch up and then the generator has to get better to fool the discriminator and you slowly get better at creating these things that are completely fake. So here's some examples which you may have seen, I, I don't know. So, um, we have these things called cycle GANs. And so uh, remember, I'm in the business of taking an input and then generating some interesting output. So you can actually take a, a cycle GAN to, for example, take a photo and then have it generate that photo in the style of Monet. Or take a picture of a zebra or zebras and turn them into horses, right? So notice that these two photos are the same, except we sort of horsified the zebras. Same thing summer to winter, right? Can I take a summer scene and turn it into a winter scene? And can I take a photograph and turn it into lots of different style, right? Now, the hard part of that, from a standard machine learning perspective, is do you ever get this? Right? You never in the natural world get a pair of here's a scene with zebras, and then here's the scene after we've magically transformed the zebras into horses, 
right? You simply cannot find data to train these things up. So what I'd like to do is to explain this cool idea. Um, and then we're going to turn this thing into denoise of EDG. Um, and that's our sort of end-to-end -end system. So notice what we've got. Very easy to find lots of pictures of horses, right? Very easy to find lots of pictures of zebras. So what we're going to do is we're going to create two of these games, right? So remember, we've got a generator. We've got a discriminator and a discriminator. This guy is just, it's another generator, but we've got to use it a different way, right? So we're going to have one GAN that learns to take a horse and turn it into a zebra, right? That's that direction. And then this guy is doing the real or fake thing, right? This GAN, this F, is going to take a zebra and learn to turn it into a horse. And then this guy is doing the discriminator. Right? Now let me just show you the next picture and that'll give you some idea of how we do this thing. So um, the reason it's called a cycle GAN, uh, ah, so what, what is one way, so one way you could cheat, right? So what you could do is you could say, hey, I'm the zebra generator. So you're gonna give me horses and I'm gonna produce pictures of zebras, right? One thing I could do is I could just memorize a picture of a zebra and just hand that to the discriminator all the time, right? Like, I don't care what horses, I don't care if there's 10 horses or two horses or 50 horses, here's a picture of a zebra that's really good and the discriminator will go, yeah, that totally looks like a zebra, right? So, but I haven't learned anything, I've just learned to generate one picture of a zebra. So, same thing in the other direction. So how do we cause that not to happen? The reason it's called a cycle GAN is that you're gonna do a round trip, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this picture of a horse I'm going to push it through the generator to turn it into a zebra, and then I'm going to push it back through this guy to turn it back into a horse. So what that does, and then I'm going to have a penalty that says, if I go round trip from horse to zebra to horse, I would like to recover something that looks a lot like the image I started with. All right? So what that's doing is it says, that's fine. If, if I try and cheat and go, I don't care what the input image is, I'm just going to give you the same zebra all the time, I'm going to get hammered when I come back this direction. Because the zebra I gave you when I turn it back into a horse doesn't look like the horse you gave me. And then we're going to do exactly the same thing over here. Now, what is the, so, so what's the beauty of that? Actually, let me try and get to the point where um, we talk about, okay, good. So how does that apply to EEG? Now, the interesting thing is about denoising EEG is it's easy, for example, to get a bunch of noisy EEG, right? It is also easy to get a bunch of noise-free EEG because I can just say, hey, like, just sit there, like, don't move, and we're just going to let you read or whatever. Um, however, it's impossible to get EEG, that, the same signal that is both noisy and, and noise-free, unless you use artificial noise, and there's all kinds of problems with that. So it's almost like I got, a bunch of, I got a bunch of pictures of horses, I got a bunch of pictures of zebras. I can get a whole bunch of noisy EEG and a whole bunch of noise-free EEG, and I want to learn a cycle GAN that can go from the noisy to the clean and back. All right, so do you see how we're doing that in this particular case? Is that, are there questions about that? Is that, like, that's the, uh, okay, that's what we're going to do. All right, and then I'm going to show you what the problem with that is, and then we have a, a little, little twiddle that'll take care of it, right? So in this case, we got noisy EEG, we're going to go from a noisy EEG signal to a noise-free EEG signal, and then we're going to go back, right? So it's that whole cycle GAN thing, so you can't just go, oh, here's clean EEG that I memorized, right? Because you got to give me the signal back that you gave me. Now, here's the problem. Oh, it's not a unicorn, sorry. Um, and in fact, there are no rainbows. So I, sorry, I lied about both of those things. It's, it's a horse in some crazy background. So, uh, okay. Um, so, so think about this way. Imagine that the horse is the EEG signal, right? And the background is the noise. So in this particular case, we're in the business of saying, I would like to just pull this guy out, right? That is the signal I'm interested in, and I want to get rid of everything else. Now the problem is, when I go to fill the rest of that stuff in, I got no idea what the noise looks like because I got rid of it, right? So now what I'm doing is I'm taking this scene, I go, oh great, I got the horse, which is the clean EEG signal, and then I handed it back to you, but I filled in noise that I just made up. Because I have, again, because I have never seen it before. 
So the Sunil um, came up with this sort of super clever idea, which is what I'm going to do is I'm going to augment this where I'm going to pull out the clean EEG signal and I'm going to pull out the noise. So I'm going to have one GAN that's trying to find what's the clean part of the signal. I have another GAN which is going to say what's the noise in the signal. And then I can combine those two things and push them back. Okay. Now, um, let me just do another couple of slides and, and, and then I'll pause again and, and see if there are questions. So, oh, okay, right. So it's equivalent to this. We're going to have this original image. We're going to pull out the signal. We're going to pull out the noise and then we can reconstruct, right? And so that, that's a neural network. That's a neural network, right? We're going to add them together and then we're going to train these two guys so that they are actually able to reproduce the original signal. Okay, just, it's exactly like, sorry, it's very much like the sort of changing styles in paintings, right? But I'm going to do it um, in this sort of slightly different way. All right, so we've got the asymmetric GAN model. What I'd like to do is just to say, you know, we've got these neural networks, which are typically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, sort of like, you know, 10, 15 layers, which is pretty common these days in the neural network world. Um, and so we have the generator and the discriminator. Uh, we do some tricks because we're working with time series data. I'm happy to talk about those. <clears throat> and what I'm trying to do is just to get to one very simple example. So I just want to show this example and then I'll pause. So what we did was we had a synthetic data set and we've got results on actual EEG data, but they're a little bit just kind of harder to explain. Um, and we created a signal with that was a combination of sawtooth, sine wave, and square wave, right? So here, for example, are these signals that are just additive combinations of sawtooth, sine waves, and square waves, right? So these are the signals. Um, we ran it through this process. Um, here is the clean signal, right? And we think about the sawtooth as being the noise component. Here is the signal cleaned by the asymmetric GAN, right? So these are the inputs. This is the denoise signal where we pull out the sawtooth. Now you can notice it's leaving like a little bit of that sawtooth in there, but you're getting the sort of core structure of the signal, um, which is very encouraging. Now we've got lots of other results uh, that I'm actually not, I, I don't wanna go through. I will say that, as I said, the student is finishing up. He's, he's written his thesis and I'm gonna um, travel this week and take it and read it. Um, but this method works quite well on denoising EG. Now the difference is, you know, I think the nice thing is that it is literally this sort of, you know, one big giant neural network, right? That's doing everything. As opposed to this kind of Rube Goldberg machine, which has all these pieces put together. So let me pause there um, and just see if there are questions about that. I, I could talk more, but that's, uh, that's, that's kind of boring. Do you have questions about the whole GAN idea? You speak more about the idea that you have fake versus real in psychiatry. You know, all, almost all these techniques, there's the uh, you know, elbow, elbow grease goes into the train. You know, like yeah. Standard. Yeah. So, right. So, um, okay, let, let me just say a little bit more about that because there are some interesting things that go on there. So, um, think about it this way like, you and I are the discriminator and the generator. Let's say you're the discriminator and I'm the generator. The way it starts out is we are untrained neural networks. You give me some normally distributed noise and I produce garbage as output, right? And it turns out the discriminator's job is way easier because basically what you're getting is garbage output and then sort of real images of things, right? Like faces, for example. And so it's super easy for you to go, that's a face, that's garbage. And so what often happens is the generator is just, it's miserable because no matter what it does, the discriminator is going fake, 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 right? It's really good at it. So imagine, it's very much like, imagine you're learning to play chess and, and your opponent is a grandmaster who just crushes you immediately, right? It's just so hard to learn when you're playing somebody who is that much better than you. So there's a lot of effort that goes into, and that's why I said that they're kind of finicky. There's a lot of effort that goes into, so like, like let's keep the discriminator in check so that it doesn't just start dominating the generator. So 
that's one thing you have to think about. Now, the sort of real fake thing, um, the, the, the way I think about it is um, the fake is always what is the generator generating, right? And the real is whatever it is that you want it to be able to mimic in the real world, right? So for us, the real was um, clean EEG signals. For the this person does not exist.com, the real is uh, pictures of real people, right? So the real is I would like you as a generator to be able to create convincing copies of this kind of thing. Does that, like, does that help? I, I don't know if I, how close I got to answering your question. Well, the, the far apart, like the very the black and white is easy to, yeah. to, but it's in that middle zone, like it could be close to the other. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so that's where the real work was. Right? That's right. So, so that that's where the the discriminator starts having a hard time. Where I finally figured out, oh, I'm generating faces. Like the neural network doesn't literally think that, right? But it goes, oh, I'm generating faces, right? So it's getting pretty good. The faces are starting to look like faces, right? That again, you have to sort of work to make sure that the discriminator doesn't dominate. Um, and so there's a, there's some art that goes into it. I will say that um, that. GANs are a bit more stable than they were, say, five years ago when these things came out. But um, the, th that sort of underlying concept of I've got unpaired things and I'd like to translate from one into the other, very doable by the GAN. Or, um, you know, I, I, you know I, again, I don't know, maybe I want to generate training images for radiology students. And I just want a generator that can generate tons and tons of images and have them you know, take a look at. You guys probably have radiology, like enough of those to be trained, right? But the idea is if I have examples of the thing I want to generate, I can train one of these things up. In, in some sense, you can think about it as sampling from that distribution. So there's a distribution over faces and that generator learns to pull a really good example of a sample from that distribution over faces. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question, which is probably very naive. Mm. But, uh, so it's like, uh, and to which this uh, just would be uh, better applied. Oh my God, this, I would say, especially in this like radiology imaging, this kind of part that we are more working, is that the one situation you would have that, okay, you would like to see where is, for example, on the image, where is the, for example, the, the brain of human or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, so someone is annotating this, this part. You know? mm -hmm. So this is like, so it's making, I don't know, 100 images in 100 equals it, you know, and then the machine can, you know, learn. The second is that, okay, you are not annotating, you are just making a box. For example, you are yep. making up five, uh, five different brains, and only one has, yep. Uh, was what you what you what what you want to have, right. and then and having these kind of uh, bugs, then maybe it's it's just easier to it, it, instead of annotating, maybe it's just easier to point. Okay, this bug is good, but, but yeah, that's right. that. So which which uh, which system is actually more more uh, more effective? Okay, yep. And then where it's easier to apply the the, the jams. So right. So um, it's always more effective to have more information. So to but, that okay. but adding information costs time. You know? Exactly, that's right. So to the extent that you can get an expert to go in and sort of circle the thing you're looking for, right, that is going to lead to the, the most effective machine learning model, right, the one that has the highest accuracy. Um, but I think what these methods are doing, so for example, multi-instance learning in GANs is saying, look, we have lots of data out there. And so maybe what we need is to have clever algorithms that can leverage that data in interesting ways. So the human, for example, can go in and go, yeah, there's like in that group, there's a bad one. In that group, there's not a bad one, right? And then let the algorithm figure it out. So it really is, I mean, in practice, when you deploy these things, the question is, um, how onerous is the task for humans? How many humans are qualified? Like, how hard is it to find somebody who's qualified to do it? And then also, how much data do you have? So uh, in machine learning, there are lots of ways of leveraging unlabeled large volumes of data to, to maximally make use of the annotations that you have. And it tends to be on kind of a case by case basis. Okay, so the second answer. Yeah, <laughs> and I feel bad about that, but it just, it's the way it is. So, um, okay, so it, it, some it, data set and then you try this, this, and then see what is the. Yeah, process. that's right, right. So, you know, if I were to put my kind of consulting hat on, you know, what I would do is sort of roll in and go, 
what data do you have? What problem are you trying to solve? What volumes of data are there? What's their quality? And then what are your constraints? So, you know, like this guy's real expensive and you, you can't get much of his time, for example, right? So then you can say, okay, in that framework, we think we can put together some machine learning approaches that look like this to kind of optimize for leveraging your data, not overburdening this guy because he's super busy. Sorry to pick on you, right? Um, so that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So for your particular Dan, uh, how, um, what's the training time and what do you use to train on? Do you have your own GPU cluster or do you have your AWS and what's the cost? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, uh, we have GPUs at UMBC, right? So we've, we, it, it is the case that um, they are uh, highly sought after commodities. And so we have a lot of people, we have GPU clusters and lots of arbitration around who uses them and when. Um, I could, I would have to refer you to Sunil to learn how long it trained, but I can tell you it's not, it's not a week and it's not an hour, right? So it's on the order of days to train one of these things up and you have to use GPUs for this thing. So, you know, it's just on, on a CPU, even a very powerful CPU and even on a clustered machine with CPUs, it would just take a really time. Did I answer your question? I, yeah. Okay. Yep. Talking about images. Yep. Um, Tactical, actual programs you are fighting for. What's the true definition of data? What, what, what is data? Is it a yeah. database? Do I ask for it? Or it can be added to the Right. That is a crisp line. Right. Found that it is data, it's not a right, It's not a crisp line for sure. So, uh, great question. Uh, again, it, it, real is defined by your goals, right? So, for the you know, this person does not exist.com, a reel is just a picture of a, you know, they, they, they go to the internet and, and go to Flickr or whatever, just grab pictures of people. Interestingly enough, I would claim that if you took the pictures they generated and called them real, they look real enough to be real, right? And so then it starts getting weird because the GAN is generating data that's not real in some objective sense, but might suffice for training a machine learning model. Um, I, you know, again, I would, I, I think that in settings where you're trying to solve a particular domain problem, the answers to those questions, despite the fact that I waffle all over the place up here and giving answers, those, those answers become much more clear. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's a database. So, so again, those guys, they went out and just sort of scraped pictures from the web. Um, and the work that we did on EEG, actually they had done an experiment to gather sort of clean and noisy EEG um, and has some controls around that. Um, but yeah, it, it would be data sitting in a database and uh, it depends on if you're doing the, um, you know, I would like you to generate more like this, in which case you just have examples of the thing, or if you're trying to do this kind of transformation between things, in which case you need unpaired examples of both kinds. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question about the Japanese version. So I have two GPUs. So are they the same as that on that? So they have one is Japanese. Uh, right, right, right. So, so that one is trying to generate the noise signal. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I'm not going to give you the like correct answer to that question. So, but it is the case they're both generating the noise, right? So. That generator, yeah, let me not, I'm not even gonna try because I'm gonna say the wrong thing. What I can do is I can send you a pointer to a paper. So if you wanted to chat afterwards, I can I can give you the paper that explains it all and you can get, yeah, okay. Okay, other, I don't know how we're doing on time. Yeah, okay, I mean, I'm happy to answer more questions. I could, I could also talk about the UBC extra core. Yeah, that's a good that would be great. That. That would be great. Oh, okay. Okay, good. So, um, okay, so uh, the UMBC Ector Core is focused on um, cybersecurity and AI. And, um, sorry, I'm having to make up all this stuff on the spot. So, uh, so on the cybersecurity side, it's interesting because in machine learning these days, and I hate to bring everything back to machine learning, but that's what I did, right? So you can think about securing, for example, medical devices. It's sort of obvious things is I've got some medical device implanted in me. I would not like that to be taken over by a malicious actor, right? 
So we have experts on um, device security. We have people there who even do this really interesting work where you've got, so imagine I've got a, a compute device like a microcontroller, a small little computer that's been manufactured somewhere. What they do is they just look at the power consumption, like how much power is that thing drawing right now? And they look at that through time. And they've even gotten the techniques down to the point where by looking at the power profile and the wobbles in that, they can figure out what instructions are being executed on it. So you can do things like say, here's the profile of the device that I asked to be constructed. Here's the profile of the device that you constructed. Did you do it correctly? Did you have a Trojan in there? That kind of thing, right? So all the way down to the hardware level. Um, also, it's the case in just sort of uh, in machine learning and AI in general, um, the, the neural networks have become the subject of attack. So uh, I, I don't know how this makes it into the popular press, but um, there, is, there are these things called adversarial patches, right? So what is an adversarial patch? So um, imagine that you've got a self-driving car that is using a neural network to recognize stop signs so it can stop, right? Uh, it turns out that you can generate a little patch like the size of a sticky note you can put that on the stop sign and it will fool almost any neural network that runs up into it to think it's not a stop sign and it's a speed limit, right? So by making very small modifications to the environment, you can cause trained models to just change their minds and do the, the wrong thing. Now, that's also a problem in you know, the medical environment because, so for example, the insulin pump, right? Uh, if I can somehow get in and poison the, the, the system that is making decisions about how much insulin to give me, Right, then I can cause bad things to happen. So it's not that I've necessarily changed the hardware, but I've done something to poison the data that's being fed into it or that was used to train it up. So cybersecurity all along those lines, and then AI and machine learning in general. So we've got people who are um, sort of what I would call world-class experts in um, deep learning in particular. So sort of all things kind of neural networks and deep networks. Also natural language processing, um, machine vision, and then some people who are sort of more generals. But, but, but again, the idea is that I think what UMBC does well, we have many people who are just very deeply knowledgeable about the technologies. And we tend to work with lots of domain experts on lots of different kinds of problems. So they're adept at saying, here's your problem. I may not be a medical expert, but I know the technology well, and we can find a way to help you solve problems that matter to you using technology that we know quite well. So that's the, that's the quick UMBC ICTOR core spiel. Well, thank you. So hmm. as well as having a, our own world expert uh, here this afternoon, we also have two other world experts, a million bank error and one thing. And um, maybe we could give you some, some practical information about mm -hmm. how to contact and tap into the experts at, at UMBC. In the sign up sheet, did you put emails or is there a way that we yes. could actually then have, have an outreach and hmm. make sure that everyone yeah. that uh, attended then got the information to contact you? I was also wondering, I know you're coming back for a few other discussions. Yep. Is there Day. Oh, absolutely. And so, you could extend the invite because it's. Um, that's right. So, I, so I, I'll be back out here on December 17th and sometime like January 9th, maybe. Um, and that's very much just what I would like, how I'd like those to go is a little bit more detail on the kinds of services that we can provide, what expertise we have, and then just kind of an open discussion about, oh, how might those things intersect with what you're doing? So, no. 
not me standing up and talking, but just like, let's have a conversation about how we might be able to interact beneficially. Yes. Yep. That's right. So, so cybersecurity and AI, AI is a little slippery these days. It generally like a lot of machine learning, but we, we also have people who are very good at um, reasoning. So, you know, if I have a knowledge base, so sorry, let me just take one step back. Uh, we actually have a couple of people who are really good at saying, for example, here's a big collection of text. Let me figure out how to get information out of that text grounded in an ontology that's relevant to the domain so I can talk about what kinds of things are there and how they relate to one another, and then doing reasoning over that to draw conclusions. So uh, that's a little bit sort of what I would call older school AI, but still very important. So we have expertise that kind of runs the gamut. A, a lot of it is at the, you know, we get a lot of raw data, let's do some interesting machine learning on it, but it goes all the way up to the level of, you know, sort of classical reasoning. So you have like two words in now. Uh, we talk a lot about AI. Mm -hmm. AI you know, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I think that uh, it often takes a little bit of system or decision making to also think at least like two words, we often talk about decision making. Yep. Uh, right. So and and you can think about that in two ways. So decision making again, sort of classically the way I tend to think about decision making as like, okay, I have something I need to do. I'll think about the trade offs, right? So that's more reasoning. There are also uh, very data driven methods for choosing what you're going to do next. Um, so, reinforcement learning is one that could be cast in that framework. There are Bayes networks. There are, so, so, you can kind of go at it from both directions, either data driven or more knowledge based. And it often just depends on, again, sort of what resources do you have available? What does your raw data look like? Is it more sort of rules and facts, or is it lots and lots of you know, sort of just raw patient data and you're trying to figure out how to do something optimal in that case. So if anyone's interested in attending one of those sessions, um, email the Ixer Navigator. I can call them on their website or on one of our cards. Make sure you get my email. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Bill. So the ICTR cause, um, the ICTR is, is an infrastructure facility and what we're here to do is to enable clinical and translational research for any investigator at UMB and UMBC. And, and the goal is discovery, is grants um, and papers. So this is just you know, the first step of an in-depth conversation and obviously you're going to have lots of different ideas and questions and uh, Dr. Oates and the, and the team will have a diverse expertise and they will be able to, to match and, and support your questions as, as, you, as you go along and um, so the ICTR will, will help there and we'll, we'll provide the three hours for you to get the uh, expert support and direction that, that you need. So ask away, please do not feel that there's any question that you can't ask, you know, the more the better. And so let's thank uh, Dr. Oates again. We always learn to, we always learn from you. Okay, thank you. I'll give that back to you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. That was really.